Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, Alone But Not Lonely, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from 1 Corinthians 7, 25 through 40. Well, I've had quite a weekend. Uh, This has been a three-ring circus, literally, for me. I've been involved in three conferences going on at the same time, and I had to shift back and forth uh, over a distance of 40 or 50 miles to be to keep involved in all of them. I uh, told one group I felt like the man who wrote a letter to Ann Landers and said that uh, uh, his wife had been complaining about how much uh, he'd been staying away and uh, away from home. And he said uh, he had planned to go out this evening, but uh, he couldn't because she had hid his teeth. And he asked what Ann Landers' response to that would be. And she wrote back and said, Dear Teeth, I think you should uh, understand that your wife is simply recognizing that you're trying to bite off more than you can chew. (laughs) Now, at all these conferences, uh, one thing that I've noted that has been of great help is that everyone has allowed time for question and answer sessions where the speaker could uh, relate to and dialogue with his audience. And uh, you'll recognize that in this letter to the Corinthians, we come to a section like that with the Apostle Paul. In chapter 7, the Apostle is answering a series of questions that were addressed to him by the congregation there in Corinth. And uh, though they had to carry on the dialogue by correspondence, Nevertheless, this is a very practical and helpful session because it is a question and answer time with the Apostle Paul. In this section, he's already discussed with us uh, the place of sex in marriage, a very helpful passage on that, the right and wrong of divorce. And now, beginning with verse 25 of chapter 7, we come to a section addressed to the unmarried, setting forth the advantages and the pressures of single life. Just for your own uh, guide through here, verses 26 through 35 set forth three advantages of singleness, and then verses 36 through 40 give us the pressures of single life. That'll be our guide through this section. Now we begin with an explanatory word the Apostle gives that covers, looks over the whole subject. He says, Now concerning the unmarried, I have no command of the Lord, but I give you my opinion is one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy or faithful. Now he means by that that he... This whole matter of single life does not have a moral issue connected with it. He's already talked about the handling of sex drives and uh, sexual immorality for either married or single. And he gave certain commands of the Lord about that and also about divorce because there were moral problems connected with that. But here there's no moral issue, and so the Lord has not spoken to this either publicly during his ministry or in private in the revelations he gave to the apostle. And therefore, Paul says he does not speak with uh, a command of the Lord. But he, he suggests that he has given this as, as a subject to be settled by apostolic guidance. That is, he is one who has been found faithful, who understands all the great issues that touch upon a question like this. And so he wants us to understand that he speaks as one who, by the Lord's mercy, has been found faithful. An apostolic word of counsel on this matter of single life. Now in verses 26 through 28, we have the first advantage that he sees in single life. I think that in view of the present distress, it is well for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? 
do not seek marriage. But if you marry, you do not sin. And if a girl marries, she does not sin. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. That does sound as though Paul had been married, doesn't it? <laughs> and some, in fact, think that the, perhaps he had. And uh, he will make reference to that uh, a little more fully. But uh, here he's clearly stating for us what he sees to be a great advantage in unmarried life. That is, it, it helps to handle the pressures that may come in a time of crisis. Everything in that paragraph uh, is, uh, hangs upon the statement in verse 26, I think that in view of the present distress, he's not talking about life in general, but in times of crisis, he says. And evidently, there, these Corinthians were facing such a time. Now, the commentators uh, are at odds as to what this crisis was. Some of them su suggest that there was a local crisis here in Corinth that he's referring to, perhaps some financial pressures or perhaps uh, a famine, economic situation of some kind, and he's talking about that. Others see in this a reference to Paul's uh, hope of the coming of the Lord. And some have suggested that perhaps he's referring to the approaching crisis that uh, was making its presence felt when in 70 A.D., as we now know, the Roman armies would have to come into Judea and quell a terrible disturbance among the Jews, resulting in the uh, capture of the city of Jerusalem and the overthrow of the temple and the dispersing of the Jewish population throughout all the nations of the earth. Now, when this letter was written it was about 57 A.D., uh, just uh, 10 or 12 years before that crisis would come, and perhaps there were four views of it beginning to develop already and that this is what Paul is talking about. My own view is that in view, because of the way the apostle is aware of the fact that he is writing scripture and that it's for all Christians in all times as he infers in some of the addresses of his letter that he's not talking about any particular immediate crisis then but he's referring to the returning crises that every generation of Christians have to face. Remember in First or Second Timothy, the apostle says to his son in the faith, in these last days, we know that in these last days, perilous times shall come. And uh, I think it's a mistake to read that as though he meant in these last days or in the last days as a reference only to the time be preceding the return of Christ. Actually, the church is always living in these last days. These last days stretch from the first return, first coming of Christ to his second return. As Hebrews 1 makes clear where it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake unto the fathers in the past has now spoken unto us in these last days by his son. Therefore, uh, this is a reference to what uh, Paul thinks of as continuing returning cycles of trouble. Now, I think you can look back through history and see how true that is. Every generation of Christians has faced a time when they thought the Lord was about to return. When events were so terrible in their viewpoint that it was leading up to the crisis of the great tribulation that would precipitate the end times and the second coming of Christ. Now, we are no exception. We're facing this kind of a crisis right in our own time, in our own day. And many today are saying, well, surely these are the days in which our Lord will return. But I believe God intended every generation of Christians to feel that. And in fact, I think 
the Lord could have returned at any of those times of crisis of the past, as he could return now. But as Jesus himself said, no one knows for sure. No one knows the day nor the hour of his return. And yet every generation of Christians faces a time of crisis like that during their lifetime. Now I think that's what Paul's referring to. And therefore this is a word that has application to Christians no matter when they've lived and surely has to us today as we face the terrible crisis of our own day and time. And it is a terrible time. Perhaps this has been a condition that's even been true clear back through all of human history, back to the very beginning. Somebody has suggested that when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, that he turned to her and said, My dear, we must understand we live in a time of transition. <laughs> and this has been true ever since. I was just in Washington, D.C. last a week or so and ago, and... One of the speakers who was addressing us about the state of the nation of the world responded to, to his introduction with these words. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, he said, and fellow passengers aboard the Titanic. <laughs> well, that indicates the kind of a crisis we live in. And in times of crisis, Paul says, single life has an advantage. You can be more flexible, you can adapt more quickly to certain sudden catastrophic actions or events. You can pick up and move if necessary, there's more mobility, there's less concern for handling all the affairs of others for whom you may be responsible. And it's true that in times of, of peril, times of deep crisis, times of danger, times of trouble, single life has great advantage over Mary. And Paul is simply listing the advantages. He's not trying to put down marriage throughout this section at all. He's trying to lift up singleness as a perfectly proper way of life. And those who choose it are not second-rate citizens, is what he's saying but they are exercising a degree of wisdom that perhaps uh, is superior to those who have simply gone along and, and gotten married without much thought and not weighed the possibilities or the advantages or disadvantages involved. And he's setting forth for us very plainly uh, what uh, might be the better course. Now, he makes clear, of course, that there's nothing wrong with getting married in a time of crisis either. It's not a sin. It may be unwise, he says, but it's not a sin. And if anybody marries, they, uh, they're not committing any kind of a terrible misjudgment. Now, we laugh at that, but actually that was uh, too often the view of the church in the past. There were whole periods of time centuries of time in the past history of the church when actually the church looked down on marriage and people were taught that to be single and to live by yourself was a superior state of spiritual uh, progress and that actually uh, the married people were the second-rate citizens. Now it's hard for us to understand that in these times but uh, nevertheless that was true. So the apostle is simply pointing out the fact that, Mary, that be, remaining single may have great advantages over choosing marriage in a time of crisis. You are less responsible, less beset with troubles. And then he adds this statement, those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. That's a practical recognition that marriage increases responsibilities. Some of you may have seen the cartoon in the paper the other night of the two men who were discussing a marriage, and one of them said, well, I'm still single thanks to Marriage Anonymous. And the other man said, what is that? Well, he said, when you get to feeling like you want to get married, you call this number, <laughs> and they send over an ugly woman in, in cold cream and curlers, 
and she nags you until the feeling disappears. <laughs> now, me Paul may have had something like that in mind. I don't know, <laughs> though I doubt it. It seems more likely that he was thinking of more mundane matters such as mortgages and taxes and in-laws and children and schooling and uh, flimsy things in the bathroom and <laughs> other problems that marriage presents one with. At any rate, he's saying those who get married take on greater responsibility and you see the argument here, in times of pressure, it may be easier and better to remain single. Now that's a wise, practical word. And therefore, somebody who lives in a time of crisis ought to weigh those advantages and disadvantages carefully before marriage. Now the second advantage he gives us in the succeeding passage, beginning with verse 29. I mean, brethren, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. Or I think uh, better, as the King James puts it, those as using this world, but not abusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. Now what he's saying here is that single life presents uh, an easier possibility of maintaining the proper priorities of life. These priorities apply to all, whether they're married or single, if, they're, if you're Christian. You ought to face life differently as a Christian than you would as a non-Christian. You ought to see things differently. You ought, to, you ought to have different value standards. You ought to measure the importance of things much differently than the world around. Whether you're, believe, whether you're a Christian or, or, or whether you're married or single, that should be true, just simply because you're a Christian. But there's the clear impl implication in all this that it's easier to do that if you remain single. And once again, he hangs this on a phrase marking the tensions of life. The appointed time, he says, has grown very short. Here again, many of the commentators uh, disagree. Some say this is a reference to the second coming of Christ, that Paul expected the Lord to return. And it is true that he did look forward to that event as occurring in his lifetime. And some think that's what he means here. The time before his return is very short. But I tend to reject that because nowhere do I ever find the scriptures exhorting us to busyness and uh, increased activity because the Lord is coming. I think it's we're exhorted to faithfulness and to soberness, but not necessarily to increased frenzy because the Lord is coming. I would rather view this as a reference to the general brevity of life. Paul is thinking perhaps of the patriarchs who had hundreds of years to live. You read in the early part of Genesis, remember they lived 600, 700, 800, 900 years. Now you can spend a very leisurely lunch <laughs> if you know that you've got 750 more years before you have to, to, uh, to leave this earth. And uh, life undoubtedly was very slow and sedate during the time of the patriarchs. And perhaps the apostle is thinking of that he's, as he says, the appointed time has grown very short. Even Moses was, lived 120 years and he didn't even start his major work till he was 80 years of age. 
But by the time you get to David in the Psalms, you find that uh, David sings of uh, the human life as consisting of 70 years at the most, or 80 if perchance you're very strong. And the remarkable thing that in the 3,000 years since that time, man has never increased or even come up to that standard of, life, of, of length of life. I was just reading the other day that the average length of life for a man, a male, in this country today is 61 years of age, 62 years of age. It's a little longer for women because they don't wear necktie. <laughs> but, but you see, we haven't even measured up to the 70 years that biblically are given to us. But whatever it is, that time goes by very fast. Just to... Two weeks ago, I turned uh, 61, celebrated my 61st birthday. And I want you to know that uh, as the years go by, they seem to go much faster. And I am increasingly aware of the shortness of time, how few years there are on this earth altogether to uh, do the things that God opens, the exciting adventures that God sets before and how one would want to pursue them more and more. The longer we live, the more we're aware of, of how time seems to fly. As someone has said, about the time your face clears up, your mind begins to go. <laughs> and this is the way life seems to be made, isn't it? Now, it doesn't take a, non -Christ, a, a Christian to see that. Non-Christians feel it as well. They, they speak of the shortness of time. And their reaction to it is, well, if we've only got this short a time, then let's grab all we can get of it. Let's live life with gusto. Let's, there's nothing beyond. And therefore, we've got to get all we can. And their philosophy seems to be, if you're going to be a passenger on the Titanic, you might as well go first class. Live it up. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. But that's not to be the philosophy of the world, uh, of the Christian, as Paul brings out. Clearly, the Christian reaction is, use this short time for eternal purposes. Be sure that the aim and center of your life is not just living, is not just making a living, but making a life. That's what he's saying. And that's why he says, let those who have wives live as though they had none. He's not encouraging to you to neglect your wife and not fulfill your responsibilities to your children and in your home and so on. It's not that at all. What he's saying, of course, is that we're to keep things in proper focus and don't let uh, maintaining your home be the major reason for your existence or give all your time to enjoying this, proper, this present life. That's what he's saying. There are higher demands and higher challenges to life than that. Marriages are only for this life. They're not for eternity. And therefore, even marriage, God-given as it is, beautiful as it is, is not necessarily the highest choice a person, an individual, can make. That's what he means throughout this whole passage. If, if someone here chooses not to get married in order that they might pursue other uh, standards, especially spiritual dimensions of, uh, of uh, involvement, then they ought to be honored for that, the apostles suggested. They're making a choice that is right and good and proper, and no one should put them down because of it. So his word to us is, don't let all these things the world around lives for become the center of your life. Joys and sorrows are going to be seen quite differently from the viewpoint of eternity. 
and uh, the world of business and success in business is not the greatest aim of life and should never be allowed to be so for a believer. For all in the world is passing away, even its fame and its glory. A few years ago, I found myself in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, where I was downtown speaking to a luncheon group. And when I came out of the building, I saw a building across the street, had a little dome on it, looked somewhat like a church. And I asked my companion what that was, and he said, that's the tomb of General Douglas MacArthur. I was immediately interested because I'd been an admirer of General MacArthur and uh, uh, lived during that era when he was the great hero, the great American hero. I admired his military prowess and his, his uh, conduct as the virtual ruler of Japan. I remembered the welcome he received here in San Francisco when he finally returned to these shores after World War II and the ticker ticker tape parade that he received and the same one in New York City, same kind of thing. And uh, so I went over to the tomb to go through it and I wandered around by myself and saw all the cabinets with his medals and his memorabilia the letters that he had written and various stages of his life, some of the uniforms he'd worn, various things that were associated with him. They were all gathering dust, and uh, the room itself, the paint was peeling from the ceiling. And as I wandered around there, I suddenly had a deep sense of the fading glory of earth. And I began to compare it mentally with what the scriptures say is awaiting the believer in Jesus Christ. That exceeding weight of glory, Paul says, which is beyond all comparison, which is waiting. Something so fantastic, so mind-blowing, so unbelievable that nothing we know of on earth can remotely be compared to that. And waiting for those who have found God's purposes and realized realized God's fullness in this life here. And how, how tawdry all this seemed to me. How the glory of MacArthur was as nothing compared with the glory of the simplest believer in Christ. How important, therefore, it was to pursue that kind of glory rather than the empty baubles that would gather dust in the museums of the world behind. And I think this is what Paul is talking about here. The form of this world is passing away. When I was a new Christian, one of the most powerful influences on my life was the life and story of D.L. Moody. And I remember reading that his favorite verse was found in 1 John, where he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that is in the world, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, and so on, is passing away. But he that does the will of God abides forever. And this is what Paul is calling us to. What what are you living for? Surely it's got to be more than to just uh, have a nice, pleasant home and a retirement plan and cram your sunset years with a few activities that you were never able to get in before you died. You see, Christians are not to live that way because they have opportunity for fulfillment far beyond this life. Supposing you don't have time to get in all the in pleasures and enjoyments here. Well, you've got lots of time beyond. That's what the apostles say. And uh, we don't have to try to cram it all into one brief episode. But what awaits is so exceedingly fantastic and beyond description that to give oneself fully to the pursuit of the things of God here is a much wiser choice than to waste one's whole existence on secondary levels 
of activity and involvement. Now it's easier, he suggests, that to do that if you remain single. And many a, a single person has made that choice. Not to get married just because uh, everyone else is doing so. But because they wanted to find out and do things that you couldn't do as you were when you were married. And to discover uh, riches that unmarried people cannot ever find the time to be involved with. Now there's still a third advantage here and it's set forth in verse 32 through 35. I want you to be free from anxieties, he said. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please his wife and his interests are divided. And the unmarried woman or girl is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you. The word actually is lasso, not to lasso you, not to tie you down but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Now that, I think, is the climax of what Paul has to say about single life. He says it makes possible a degree of dedication and devotion, of commitment to the work of Christ that married life does not allow. Now, he doesn't mean there's anything wrong with a husband trying to please his wife or a wife trying to please her husband. God elsewhere has said that that's what marriage is for. That's what we ought to do in marriage. What he's saying here is if you have the gift of celibacy, of singleness, then for you it's better not to be married. Others, it's better for them to be married, but for you, it's not. And your highest a fulfillment with respect to the things of God can be discovered if you remain single instead. How much the world owes to men and women who have chosen to remain single uh, rather than to be married for the Lord's sake. I think of men like John R. W. Stott. I never hear that great English preacher without rejoicing at the godliness, the sheer saintliness of his life. And when he tells us, as I've heard him say, that he spends two or three hours every morning in Bible study and prayer and uh, worship of the Lord, you can see where much of that godly spirit comes from. Now, I find that very difficult to do as a married man. Certain demands... Uh, Certain requirements and responsibilities of the household make it very difficult to fulfill that kind of a schedule. And uh, I frankly don't do it. But I'm very grateful that there are men like Stott who can and who do. And how he's enriched the entire evangelical world by his writing and his preaching that has that deep spiritual element to it that grows out of the time that he can give to the pursuit of the things of God. One, I think of Henrietta Mears, that remarkable woman on the staff for so long of the Hollywood Presbyterian Church, and of the literally scores, if not hundreds, of young men that are in the ministry today because she captured their imaginations and taught them the scriptures and made them alive and chose never to be married that she might have the time to give to the study of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God with such remarkable power and effect. If you look further back in history, you see men like Robert Murray McChain of Scotland, the sainted young man who shook the whole British Isles by his godliness. Even though he died at uh, around the age of 30, he was a remarkable influence and still is in many areas of the church today because of his saintliness. And men like C.S. Lewis, who never married until their 60s and who gave to the world such a brilliant 
array of philosophic probing of the depths of Christian truth, such as the world ought to be eternally grateful for. Now, all that the apostle is saying is the, there's an opportunity for abundant labors uh, by remaining single that married life simply does not afford. In this last issue of Decision Magazine, there's an article by Margaret Clarkson. One of the, she's a hymn writer, a prolific writer today, a single woman. And uh, she, her hymns have been a tremendous blessing to me. One of my favorites is her hymn, We Come, O Christ, to Thee. And uh, she writes an article with the title, Single But Not Alone. And this is her opening paragraph. To know God, to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that He is sovereign and that my life is in His care, this is the unshakable foundation on which I stay my soul. Such knowledge has deep significance for the single Christian. Then she goes on to tell of her struggles, how she didn't accept singleness for a long time, but how she finally came to understand that this was God's choice for her and how much, how grateful she ultimately became that he led her along these lines and how profound was her experience of discovering that God could meet the loneliness of her life and she would never be alone with his presence. Now, I think this is what Paul has in mind. He himself is an example of this. We owe the, in, the Herculean labors of this mighty apostle to the fact that he was free from the encumbrances of marriage and was able to travel up and down the whole length and breadth of the Roman Empire and out of that dedication of spirit and devotion of heart, lived in comp complete moral purity by the grace and power of God, there come these remarkable letters that have changed the history of the world. Well, all he's saying, of course, is that single life is okay. And if anyone desires to choose it, it's a high and a holy calling and one that's perfectly appropriate. Now he turns in the latter part to the, to the pressures of singleness. Paul's a realist, and he knows that it's not easy to be single. One of the pressures every single person faces is sexual pressure. And so Paul brings that up, verse 36. If anyone thinks that he's not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it is, has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So that he who marries his betrothed does well and he who refrains from marriage will do better. Now, this is a little bit difficult uh, to translate because the, uh, it, it, it's somewhat difficult to understand just who the apostle is referring to here when he talks about uh, someone and his betrothed. Now, some commentators feel that he's referring to a father and his virgin daughter because in the culture of that day, it was up to the father to arrange the marriages. And that that's what he's talking about, a father and daughter. Others feel, as this version uh, seems to indicate in, in other versions, that he's talking about an engaged couple, a betrothed couple, as this language employs. And he says, in effect, if they, if they find it difficult to keep their passions under control, if they're always struggling in this area, if they tend toward the dangerous area of giving way to sexual in immorality, then it's better, far better for them to marry. Let them marry. It is no sin, he said. But if they have the gift of continence, if they're 
Though their passions are strong, nevertheless, they keep them under control. And they decide that it's better not to marry, to pursue other certain advantages that he's already listed. Then he says, uh, let them, uh, le uh, it's better for them not to marry, and in fact, it would be a weakness for them to do so. Now, what he suggests is that it's very possible to control these sexual drives. And the key is this word here, this phrase. Whoever is firmly established in his heart. What he's talking about there is someone who has learned to be secure in his identity as being one with the Lord. He's learned the secret of strength, and that is the affirmation of significance and meaning which he must have in order to function is coming not from others, but from the Lord. He knows who he is before God. He deeply draws upon the love and strength and re and affirmation of Christ himself. And therefore, he's able to handle even the pressures of sex. Now, if that's the case, Paul says, then he will do well not to marry because it opens to him doors of opportunity that he can enter into that marriage would not permit. And then finally, he takes up the matter of emotional pressures. Verse 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If the husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I have the Spirit of God. He's obviously thinking of an older woman, a widow, whose husband has died and uh, she's left alone and facing the declining years of her life. She misses the companionship. She misses the, the fellowship of her mate. And in the emptiness of her life, she's tempted to plunge back into marriage just for companionship alone. Now, Paul says, be careful there. Be careful. That's an emotional pressure. And many succumb to it without any thought about what uh, the alternatives might be. But he says, if she does, it's all right, it's not a sin to remarry, as long as it's to a Christian, someone in the Lord, whom she can share her faith and life with. But in my judgment, he says, it's better she'll be happier if she remains unmarried. Notice the ground he chooses. Her own happiness is involved in it. Why? because she has learned a lot of secrets about life. And she's learned a lot of things about how to handle herself. And now she has an opportunity to put them into practice in a way she never had when she was married. And now may be the golden opportunity of her life. And she may find a renewed sense of adventure and excitement she's never felt before. And so, in my judgment, Paul says, and I think I have the Spirit of God, which is probably the understatement of the century, I think she'd be happier if she remained unmarried. Now, all that he's saying is that uh, married life is good and proper and right, but so is single life. And I think the thrust of this whole passage is against those who tend to look down upon and make jokes about single people and look upon them as odd or strange or even perverted and uh, make disparaging remarks about uh, when they're going to get married and what's wrong with them that nobody's chosen them and so on. We Christians ought above all others face the facts as Paul lays them out here and see that single life is a perfectly appropriate style of life and approve of it and encourage it if those, if some desire to, uh, to fulfill that and to choose that. What a wholesome view of life this is. But whatever it is, married or single, the great thing is that we keep our priorities in focus and that we live not for this passing world scene, 
but for that greater life that lies waiting for us in that unbelievable world of opportunity that awaits beyond. That's where Christians' hopes ought to be. Well, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Again, we thank you, Father, for the practicality of your, of your word, this counsel from the wise and loving heart of the Apostle Paul. We pray for all the single people in this congregation this morning, some who are going on to marriage soon and look forward to it with anticipation and delight, others to whom you already now, Lord, are suggesting that perhaps you have another style of life for them. May they accept that with gladness and joy and look forward to an increasing adventure of delight along other paths than some of their friends have chosen, but nevertheless filled with the possibility of fulfillment and satisfaction. We ask in Jesus' name.